Um, welcome everyone to our Days for Girls Menstrual Hygiene Day webinar entitled Periods in and After the Pandemic, Refugee Spotlight. And today we will be exploring the question, how have strategies for meeting the menstrual health needs of refugee women and girls shifted or even built back better in the face of COVID-19? And my name is Haley Malay. I am the advocacy manager here at Days for Girls International. And I'll just start us off with a bit of housekeeping. So today's session will start with a message from Ina Yorga of Wash United about Menstrual Hygiene Day coming up on May 28th and how you can be involved. And then our moderator, Danielle Kaiser, will take us through opening remarks and introduction of our panelists into the main panel discussion. And that conversation will be interspersed with video stories from refugee women and girls in Lebanon and also in Rwanda. And then we will open it up for some Q&A from all of you. So please feel free to submit any questions that you have in the Q&A box throughout the course of our conversation. And we will be fielding those questions for panelists to answer at that time after the panel discussion. And we'd love to thank our honorary hosts for this event, Wash United, MH Hub, and I'm Her. Um, our partners at I'm Her will be creating a synopsis of the learnings and themes from this conversation. So please keep an eye out for that article in the coming months. And with that, I will pass it off to Ina. Thank you, Hailey. Hello, good morning or good evening, everyone who joined the meeting. Um, I'm very excited to be here. It's a very busy week, but that's because it's MH Day on Friday, so we're all here together. Um, just uh, for those who still might have not seen all the, the news, just want to share that the theme is more action investment in menstrual health and hygiene now. You find materials that you can use in English, French, Hindi, Arabic, and Spanish, um, even German, <laughs> in case you speak German. We have an infographic. There's an awesome uh, campaign video that also Days for Girls participated in. Diana is uh, represented you, so that's that's amazing. I hope you join the bracelet action. Um, share with us your events, and uh, all the highlights will be shared uh, in Studio MH Day on 3rd June. So. That, that, that is a small recap of what's happening, and I know you're all busy, but I want to show then the next slide, which is very dear to our heart and fits very well to our um, session today. So, because worldwide, there are more than 800 million people who are in uh, like displaced pe persons, according to UNHCR, that is due to emergencies, political unrest, environmental concerns, uh, and so on. So they're not all refugees, um, and they're uh, and not all in, uh, internally displaced people. But um, these are the latest data, and they are higher than ever before. And we all, like UNHCR and uh, other partners, expect that these numbers increase due to the COVID crisis. There are disaggregated data according to age and gender. So quite interestingly, um, they don't add up, but one can say that roughly a quarter of those 800 million people are women and girls in reproductive age. So and really the challenge, as you can imagine, uh, in an emergency situation, uh, when MHM is already challenging for people living at home in an emergency situation, you're faced higher challenges according to safety, privacy, and access to services. So why we all have the same aim to also uh, ensure for women and girls living in uh, emergency situations, humanitarian settings, to also manage their uh, menstruation with privacy and with dignity uh, and in a healthy manner and safe and safe um, it requires a little bit more coordination even more coordination <laughs> across the different uh, aspects and across the different um, sectors that are working working there 
Um, and we you will hear more about successful approaches and from the learning from our amazing speakers uh, this afternoon. Uh, so overall, what we also know that emergencies are, are underfunded. We do, it's a roughly two hundred billion dollar was missing from just the UN appeal uh, last year. So you can imagine uh, a little bit uh, how much money is missing overall. And from that, while there's no exact data on the needs for menstrual health uh, and hygiene or menstrual hygiene management in emergencies, you can just imagine that if there's so much money already missing that the needs of women and girls for their menstruation related challenges are completely uh, neglected and underfunded. Um, so we created this wonderful infographic, which was just ready yesterday, uh, together with uh, the Red Cross, uh, International Federation of the Red Cross, UNFPA, UNSCR, um, who have an MHM in emergency working group. So we're really glad to show it here in case you haven't seen it, so you can make use of it in your work. And with that, um, I want to lead to over to now the, oops, sorry, to the um, speakers and hear from their experience solutions um, to you. Yeah, thank you very much and have a happy MH day. Hi everybody. Um, thank you so much, Ina. Uh, that was a really great overview. And thank you so much for sharing that really helpful infographic. I hope everyone gets their um, hands on it and can share it in social media and beyond. Um, my name is Danielle Kaiser, and I'm the executive director of the Menstrual Health Hub, or MH Hub. And um, Ina gave a really great and thorough overview of the importance of um, understanding the needs of women and girls um, in informal settlements and refugees settlements and humanitarian aid program settings um, because they set a they, they face a really unique set of challenges, including overcrowding, lack of wash infrastructure, and a lot of other barriers, which we'll explore today. Um, I wanted to kind of set the scene a little bit uh, with a, um, an exciting announcement. Um, this year, the definition of menstrual health was finally put out into the world underneath the Global Menstrual Collective. And together with this group of experts and academics and through a real consultative process, um, we put forward this new definition um, that can be used in policy practice and research. And it's really built off of the WHO definition of health. Um, so it's defined as a complete state of physical, mental, and social well-being, and not just the absence of disease or infirmity in relation to the menstrual cycle. So what's great about this definition is that it breaks down menstrual health into five distinct and different directions. Um, one being uh, around age appropriate information about the menstrual cycle. Um, the second being about care for bodies during menstruation, such that preferences, hygiene, comfort, and privacy are supported. So we have the hygiene component very strong here in the second aspect. Um, then moving into the access to timely um, uh, diagnosis or treatment and care for menstrual related discomforts and disorders. Um, and then the last two points really round out the importance of having a positive and respectful environment. And then also deciding whether and how to participate in all spheres of uh, civil life, whether that's cultural, economic, social, or political. So the reason I'm sharing this important uh, definition is that um, now that we have this, we can uh, provide a needed foundation for which rights can be realized and conditions can be improved beyond just the hygienic management of the period so that there is a promise of improved care and concern throughout the menstrual cycle and across the life course. So um, to bring things kind of into the current moment, um, the title of this panel is It's Time for Action, Periods in and After the Pandemic. Um, we really want to focus on the way in which COVID-19 and all of the fallout from the pandemic has really exacerbated the existing challenges and presented new ones that intensify poor menstrual health, particularly in humanitarian settings. Um, some of these challenges include the lockdown itself, which has prevented consumers from traveling to markets and purchasing products, um, global supply chain interruptions, inflation, um, and shifts in funding priorities, as Ina said, which really uh, has redirected funds away from programs which may have otherwise provided a regular supply of period products to those in need. 
So as the, the theme of uh, Menstrual Hygiene Day this year is it's time for action, um, we really want to focus on those that have been involved in the action on the ground. And that's why we wanna highlight these kind of um, experiences and really hear from people on the ground who have been working um, in uh, refugee settings and humanitarian contexts. So I'm really, really excited and honored to introduce our panel. Um, they will appear pop, 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 pop in our screen soon. Um, first, we have uh, Oramida Adutayo. Um, she's a program officer from UNFPA Bangladesh, and she's been working in Cox's Bazaar. Um, next up, we have Anne Bittner, who's an associate protection officer from UNHCR Rwanda, and she's been working with the uh, Kaziba camps there. Um, then we have Juliet Akwango. She's a program officer for Days for Girls in Uganda and has been working in the Kiriandogo refugee settlement, um, predominantly hosting refugees uh, from South Sudan. And then last but certainly not least, we have uh, Khairia Al-Assad, the country coordinator for Days for Girls Lebanon. So I'd like to warmly welcome all of our panelists today. Um, thank you for joining us, um, whatever time it is for you in the world. Um, so I wanna jump right in, if that's okay, um, and start with the Days for Girls representatives, since this is a Days for Girls uh, hosted event. So um, as, implemented, as implementing um, MH partners who work both in and outside of refugee camps, um, I'd love to hear what particular menstrual health and hygiene challenges that you've seen that are specific to where you are working. So in this case, this would be in Lebanon and in Uganda. Over to you. Kadia, we can start with you. Yes. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you so for this uh... Webinar. Uh, I'm Khairi Asad from Lebanon. I'm the, as you said, I'm the country representative in Lebanon. Uh, first of all, let me tell you about Lebanon's situation. So Lebanon uh, has in the forefront of Syrian uh, crisis from 2011, and uh, and currently hosting 1.5 million of Syrian refugees. In addition of this, uh, Lebanon have uh, Palestinian refugees coming from Palestine for, from long time and have Palestinian refugees also coming from Syrian also. So from 2011, Syrian refugees continue to have multiplied of uh, humanitarian needs and uh, women and girls start facing a lot of problem in dignity, safety and everything led to, to period. So uh, as Days for Girls, we start working from 2014 in Lebanon. We, we work in three main sectors. So making uh, Days for Girls good. So Syrian women start getting uh, some income to help their family. Second, we, we do health awareness session for girls or, and women in the Syrian camp. And third, we do distribution for this, for this kit, which is uh, washable pad. So, uh, I will I will share with you some big challenges face, facing uh, women and girls in Lebanon. This uh, this is a challenge we get it from uh, UNICEF uh, report and from uh, from our uh, focusing group. So I will share with you four main uh, issue. So first of all, the lack of information about the MHM available for women. So 74% of women and girls say they don't have the adequate uh, information and this, they get their information from friends or for, from mom, which is not uh, always right. Second, the major of uh, women and girls feel unsafe when they need to change their uh, sanitary pad because they change it in the kitchen or in the bathroom, which is, uh, not separated and there is one bathroom for all camps, so not easy. So people, 60% of women and girls said they feel unsafe to changing their uh, sanitary issue, uh, period, uh, period uh, material. Uh, in addition for this, uh, the uh, disposable material is not uh, adequate or is not, uh, in a good quality because women and girls, Syrian and women and girls, if they have money, they will not pay 
sanitary issue or sanitary pads, they will pay food or will pay it for medical medical issue. So we'll not pay for getting sanitary sanitary pads. Uh, the the main problem is the culture belief and the taboo surrounding uh, menstruation and our with spread and often the propaganda of women. So 100% of women said that there is a lot of taboo and cultural belief surrounding menstruation. And it is like, it is uh, forbidden or uh, haram to take shower, go to kitchen or uh, doing any, uh, uh, go to, to ground also to make any uh, agriculture issue. So, and if you, if you look like this, it's not mentioned in Quran, it's only taboo and only propaganda, not uh, uh, something good. So, this is before COVID-19. So if we look after COVID-19, what will happen? It is the same issue because we don't, don't have any solution for it. And in, in addition for this, we have, we start having a big, uh, this problem was going big because all uh, during the pandemic issue, all NGOs stopped working, the lockdown and the uh, physical system distancing, uh, the, uh, system distancing uh, issue was uh, are in place. So no distribution, no health awareness session. And if, there is a, have, uh, if, if they have, we have awareness session, we'll do it through internet or through our phones or like this, which is not available in a Syrian camp. So if you look like this, so in Syrian camp, no internet, no distribution, no anything related to menstruation issue so this this all will, uh, challenges was will be uh, go bigger big and big uh, thank you so much for that uh, Khadiya. um I, i'd love to hear from juliet as well uh, what some of the challenges have been there thank you very much thank you very much danielle like Keria rightly stated in Uganda, we've been implementing in a number of refugee camps. We've implemented in Chiriandongo, we've implemented in Changwali, we've also implemented in uh, Chaka too. And across all the refugee camps, we find that infrastructure is particularly and especially a major challenge. We see that the infrastructure does not cater for privacy needs. And while talking about infrastructure, we are looking at changing rooms we are looking at privacy we are looking at incinerators so this is not available for the women making the spaces there not friendly and not very conducive for them to be able to achieve um, what we would call comprehensive and holistic menstrual health um, management another thing that stands out um, across all the refugee camps where we've implemented whether one shot or um, for a longer period of time, we see that there is um, a connotation where menstruation is considered to be more of a feminine issue and men would don't like to get involved. And yet in our implementation, we find that men are such critical and crucial stakeholders in being able to um, achieve menstrual health equity. I remember we, when we implemented in Chaka 2, we ran a pilot there and in the pilot, we were trying to um, assess what it would look like to set, a, set up an enterprise in the refugee settlement. And then we had a combination of both men and women. And we found that men on the contrary never liked to get involved as they thought, oh, menstruation is a women's issue, menstruation is a girl's issue and none of their business. So that um, is one outstanding challenge that um, I find common across all, all the refugee camps where we've been involved. And um, in the face of COVID, we find that there is really um, limited uh, variety for women um, and girls in terms of menstrual solutions. We see that a number of development agencies and development partners will once in a while distribute and most, most time it is uh, disposable products and as a result there is a lot of reliance on those and in the face of COVID we see that 
with the interrupted access to market with the um, priorities, uh, disrupted priorities and funding, this really posed uh, a major challenge. And as I wrap it up, for this session, um, we find that there is also a um, need for more sustainable health um, interventions and in this refugee settlements that are truly locally led and locally inspired. That way we'll be able to reach our sustainability, but as well as putting um, the power, putting the solution, putting um, information right in the hands of um, these refugee women and girls to enable them manage their period in a safe, sustainable, but also self-sustainable and holistic manner. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, thank you so much for speaking to the importance of a participatory approach as well with refugee women and girls. Um, I think we see in the aid programs and interventions, a lot of top down, just kind of take what you can get kind of action. And it's really great to hear the, the importance of kind of working with the community, listening to, taking advice from, and really having them be um, very active in the process. Thank you. Um, I wanna turn to now um, the panelists, Aramida and Anne. Um, you know, we're, if we're thinking about uh, COVID-19 um, and its impacts, you know, there was menstrual health programs ahead of the pandemic. Can you speak a little bit about what was in place before COVID-19 in the, in the um, communities where you worked? And then afterwards, maybe a little bit um, about what has changed since the pandemic. Thank you so much, Danielle. So I'll start. So in the Bohengia refugee response, um, quite a few of the programs that are in place uh, that were in place before COVID-19 they either directly um, or indirectly focus on menstrual health management. So in particular, all the work that UNFPA does in the behavior response, which was in place before COVID-19, um, focused on that as well. Um, so for the programming focusing directly on menstrual health management, um, includes the distribution of hygiene kits, dignity kits, and menstrual health kits, of which a lot of partners are engaged in, including UNFPA. So these distributions include, you know, the pre provision of kits in risk areas, and it happens on a regular basis. And it's also in response to emergencies such as monsoons, floods, cyclones, and most recently a fire. Um, UNFK works with implementing partners um, to provide SRHR and gender response transformative life skills education. So what, what is referred to as, it, what is similar to the Bangladesh version of comprehensive sexuality education. And through this component, there is a strong kind of strong focus on teaching adolescents, girls, and boys about menstruation, about menstruation, and how girls can manage their menstrual health. Um, so UNFPA also works very closely with parents and caregivers to also increase their capacity through um, structured sessions and sensitization and education to support their daughters' menstrual health. Um, there are also quite a few organizations, UNFPA included. We're also teaching women and girls how to make reusable and disposable sanitary pads, um, which they then can share and distribute amongst their peer groups. And also important to note that all of the MHM menstrual health management focus or related programming is informed by the joint response plan for the Rohingya refugee response, and is also guided and supported by a robust intersector coordination group. Um, in terms of what has changed now due to COVID-19, and one of the things that I have observed is that there's a greater focus on menstrual health because many organizations have been able to twin, you know, the focus on hygiene and hand washing um, that, you know, that present a role due to, due to the COVID-19 pandemic with the, and to really use that to highlight and feature, you know, the reality of women, menstruating women and girls, right? Um, and the, the dual reality of having to worry about, you know, not contracting COVID-19, but also having to maintain your uh, maintain a level of hygiene, you know, during your regular menstrual, menstrual cycle. So I think the COVID-19 pandemic has presented um, an opportunity for very high levels of a high, very high levels of sustained advocacy around menstrual health because of this kind of increased focus on hygiene. Over. Wow, that's fascinating, and thank you for that, like optimistic view at the end. Um, that that twinning response has been um, we've seen that everywhere. So uh, before we turn to Anne, I just want to remind anyone who's uh, new, hello and welcome. If you have any questions for our panelists, we'll be having a Q and A at the end. So please do put them in the chat box, and they'll be fielded um, towards the towards the end. Um, so Anne, I wanted to. Um, 
to turn over to you now and kind of ask how uh, how COVID-19 has disrupted um, the MH uh, programs that were in place there. Maybe you can talk a little bit about what has been in place beforehand with UNHCR and then um, afterwards and what are some of the challenges that you've seen um, over? Okay, so good. hello everyone. I don't know, depending on the time, it's uh, where you are. Uh, so I'm speaking from Rwanda, where I work uh, for UNHCR in a camp called Kiziba, uh, where it hosts around 17,000 uh, Congolese a refugee camp. It's one of the eldest camp uh, in Rwanda. It's been there for around 25 years. Uh, so not to repeat what my uh, colleagues from other uh, locations have mentioned, maybe an additional challenge uh, that we have here and where UNHCR together with partner works a lot is on uh, WASH aspects um, related to menstrual hygiene, uh, but more when it comes in infrastructure to the rehabilitation of latrines and uh, construction of dislodgeable latrines combined with waste management, because of course this is uh, a very challenging aspect um, for hygiene in general in the camp, but also for women in dealing with their um, menstruation. Uh, so we've been uh, working together with a, a WASH partner. One of the challenges accessibility uh, of the camp and uh, rehabilitation, because as I mentioned, it's a, an old camp which does not fulfill the current standards uh, in terms of uh, organization of the camp, uh, etc. Uh, when it comes to menstrual hygiene uh, management, of course, before uh, COVID, we also had uh, cooperation with partner, a health partner to provide sexual and reproductive health uh, sensitization programs for women, uh, for girls, for students. They work together with uh, community-based group, uh, with peer-to-peer -peer student groups. Uh, Etc. We also had involved uh, more broadly our protection partners uh, in child protection, for example, in SGBV uh, to conduct sensitization, let's say more on the related risk, protection risk uh, related to uh, menstrual hygiene on early pregnancy, uh, for example. So whenever they would have an activity with uh, youngsters, they would have some uh, prevention message uh, to be broadcasted uh, for them or to have some uh, small sensitization uh, with them. Uh, we also have um, set up based on the standards from uh, Rwanda for education, what we call a, a girls safe room uh, within the school. So it's also aiming at responding uh, to all the challenge of um, private and the uh, ability to change and deal with the menstrual uh, period for student girls. Um, but to shift to the question of COVID, obviously all this has been uh, completely um, put on hold uh, by the COVID context because all the sport or recreational activities that we used to have with youngsters where all this message could be spread, of course it has been stopped. Uh, the school have been closed for like eight months, so this girl's room was not accessible uh, anymore. Uh, the health partner has been focusing a lot on uh, hygiene, hand washing, uh, COVID prevention. So of course the sexual and reproductive health aspect, uh, they've not been neglected, but let's say maybe this was not the main uh, focus anymore. Um, something that has taken place uh, as well uh, from UNHCR side, it's a shift in the assistance from in-kind, so where we used to distribute um, some cotex, disposable cotex uh, for women, and we shifted recently in January to uh, cash uh, assistance. Uh, so um, while at first the objective is to give more leeway and freedom to women to purchase what they want with COVID, uh, of course it came at a time uh, a challenging times in terms of supply and priorities in the expense uh, of the family. Uh, and on top of it, we also have, uh, unfortunately, uh, a reduction in the assistance from uh, World Food Programme in terms of um, money provided, like cash provided to buy uh, food. Uh, so we also unfortunately expect that in the first place, this uh, cash assistance for menstrual hygiene uh, might be diverted uh, to cover some other uh, needs uh, from the family. 
Um, but what we've tried uh, to do, uh, we've been working with Day for Girls for a year right now, introducing a pilot project on a reusable uh, sanitary pads, um, dignity kits with provision of a sexual and reproductive health session. It took place right before COVID uh, started last year for the International Women Day. So we're expecting this pilot project to raise awareness about alternatives uh, in terms of menstrual uh, hygiene. And the first feedback we received were uh, quite um, positive. We have also explored um, more like innovative uh, sensitization um, initiative where we rely way much more on community-based group, as I mentioned, like peer-to-peer -peer students or the Kiziba Women Committee or the school headmaster even that have been really proactive uh, in approaching uh, refugees uh, to raise awareness about the risk of uh, school dropout, early pregnancies, uh, etc. And uh, we also try to, let's say the sensitization message that we used to give as a um, like mass gathering or during events, we've been recording them through the help of, uh, let's say skilled refugees that we identified. And uh, all this sensitization message for the 16 days of activism for the International Women Days this year have been uh, uploaded on uh, Facebook groups and YouTube channels that are managed by refugees themselves, uh, by youngsters. So we also expect this as a, um, let's say, innovative communication channels to reach, uh, especially these target groups of youngsters that uh, maybe sometimes stay out of the um, regular uh, communication channels um, that we have. Um, so yeah, let's say COVID in a way also provides us with an opportunity to, uh, to renew or uh, innovate in our ways of working. So it's always uh, positive. Thank you. Wow, thank you so much, Anne. That was really descriptive. And it's interesting to hear um, both the challenges and the opportunities that have presented themselves. Sometimes crisis enables uh, one or a group to actually innovate, right? And be able to change and test something out that was only maybe an idea. Um, so um, these innovative communications materials um, and the way that they're being uh, distributed throughout the community could be a, um, a silver lining. Um, I wanted to now uh, turn to everyone. Um, this is our last question before the Q&A. Um, and we'll do this kind of a lightning round style um, with two minutes per person. Um, so while we have made lots of strides in the MH world and leveraged opportunities in spite of the pandemic, um, I think we can all agree that we still have a ways to go before menstrual health is truly prioritized in the ways that we all hope and dream for. Um, and that's why we look to our program experts on the ground for some, some answers and some inspiration. Um, what do you envision is next menstrual health in refugee communities? Um, where, where do we need to continue to advocate? Where do we need to put energy? And uh, what tangible actions could be taken to build back better in terms of making sure menstrual health is a priority? We'll start with Juliet, then go to Javier, um, Anne, and then uh, our last panelist, um, Oramita. Thank you, Danielle. Um, for me, there is need for increased advocacy at national level. There is need to steer different national stakeholders so that they prioritize MHM and the national strategic plans, as well as the national development goals. I'm proud to say that this year, Uganda is already working on the um, MHM strategic plan running from uh, 2021 to uh, 2024, if um, I got it right. And what uh, really is outstanding is there is a section there that goes to cater for um, MHM in refugee context. So we are on the right track. They just need um, to be stared ahead as well as, you know, bring more accountability in as well as uh, being cooperated in the planning and the execution. So advocacy is the way to go. Mm -hmm, definitely. Um, Haria? Yes. So after COVID-19, we, we feel we must 
uh, working in three main uh, titles. So first we start, we must start collaborate, collaboration with other sector from other NGOs like WASH and protection sector. So every woman will make sure that every woman have water, uh, soap, they have a separated toilet with uh, uh, clock, uh, clock able uh, doors, they have a lighting, so improving lighting. So working with other sector, uh, focusing on for, for uh, focusing on distribution for washable food. So in any distribution in any pandemic uh, situation, every woman and every girl will have their their material. So don't need to be uh, afraid in this seven days. And third, we, uh, we we must start working with boy and men. So when they have all information about MHM and about the woman and about periods, so we'll will take care of women in any pandemic uh, situation. Great, thank you so much. Um, Anne, um, would love to hear from you as well. Uh, yeah, as I said, I think to complement um, what I mentioned, I think there is still a need to change the, the mindset and all the stigma uh, that uh, surrounds uh, menstruation. So I think working with a community-based group uh, from the community itself uh, through new communication channel is one of the key aspects uh, to be uh, developed and hopefully uh, change uh, all the attitude and negative attitude as mentioned by colleagues involving men uh, as well um, is really important. Uh, and then another point of advocacy, I think, uh, is to introduce uh, new, new products as a reusable sanitary pads or a moon cup, something that can um, respond both to the challenge I raised for wash aspects, uh, for example, for privacy, uh, for women, um, for comfort, just because we know that it might prevent girls to access school, for women to go for a job uh, opportunities. Um, and then a last uh, aspect is possibly to see how uh, producing uh, these kind of products even within the camp could be like an interesting uh, entrepreneurial uh, opportunity for women and men who could also contribute both to um, remove the stigma uh, around uh, menstrual hygiene, uh, but also empower and uh, provide uh, jobs and uh, livelihood entrepreneurial uh, opportunities uh, for refugees. Um, so yeah, I would say this, uh, this is a good opportunity that should be uh, expanded uh, within refugee camp at, as it allows to respond to many needs uh, of refugees. Thank you. Thank you, it's very uh, forward looking. Aramida, I'd love to hear from you as well. Yes, thank you. Um, I wholeheartedly agree with everything my colleagues have said. I think one final point that I'll add that has been mentioned yet is that, you know, I personally think that there needs to be much better and greater coordination and collaboration across sectors on, on menstrual health. You know, it's truly a cross-cutting issue. And it's important that actors, you know, whether it be WASH, education, protection, health, site management, livelihoods, uh, it's incredibly important that all of them integrate mental health management and MHM programming into their regular planning. So that for me is a big priority going forward. Over. Wonderful. This is all, you know, in, in, in a time like this, when things are depressing and we're getting down, it's really great to hear that there's hope and there's light at the end of the tunnel and that there's work that we can be doing in ways we can be thinking differently and shifting the narrative. Um, I wanted to hand it over to um, Haley to show us two videos um, from the, the camps. The first one coming from Rwanda, I believe, and then the second one coming from, uh, I believe, Lebanon. So um, can you show us the videos, please? And maybe um, each respective um, um, representative can give a little context before the video is shown. So I think um, Anne first. Yeah, and so if you would like, while I'm popping this up on the screen, just to kind of introduce the video and um, share a little bit about um, the beneficiary that we'll be hearing from. Um, so yeah, we just interviewed uh, in preparation of uh, this webinar, uh, one of uh, a young girl, uh, as you can see, a teenage girl from uh, Kiziba camp. 
uh, who's going to talk especially, uh, as I mentioned, in this shift uh, in the modalities of assistance uh, from this in-kind distribution to uh, cash uh, assistance, which while it was aiming to empower women, uh, is also posing uh, some challenges right now for women, given the context, the COVID context, uh, but also this uh, reduction um, in assistance. So uh, she'll explain better uh, than me, uh, but this is the background of this video. Thank you. Thanks so much. No, Mr. Flora, Umva, Arinichi, wasaba ko cyakorwa kugira ngo ibyo bibazo bibashe gukemuka cyangwa se bibashe kujya mu nzira nyayo mwongere mu musubire mu buzima bwiza ku buryo nyine ubasha kubaho neza wumva wisanzuye nyine cyo badufasha bagabira ibyo bikoresho kuko kuko nyine akenshi nakenshi twambara ibyaha ibyo ikadutwika kandi murabona ko umubyeyi ntago yabona ntago yabona ibyo kuduha ibyo kutugaburira abone n'ibyo bikoresho bya byintu bya kutex ntago byashoboka kandi kandi icya gatatu nyine nuko nyine mwebwe nka kongera mu ka bise abenshi abenshi ntago ntago babaraso nakirwa neza mwa mwebwe icyo mwadwa mwadukorera nuko ngera mu katwigisha Thanks. Thank you, Anne. Um, and then Kyria, would you like to introduce the video that we're showing from um, the camps in Lebanon? Yeah, it is uh, our senior refugees beneficiaries. So it is in North Lebanon, it is a Syrian camp in aboard Syria. Uh, she talked about this bad situation in Lebanon because not only about Syrian refugees only because in Lebanon we have also the bad economic situation. So yeah. Thank you. One second. All right. My name is Fatima. I came from Syria in 2011. I was 33 years old. I have three children. وجيت بسبب الحرب وأسم في الحرب وهي فعلا شردنا أنا وولادي وجبت أهل لبنان لهون قبل الأزمة الكورونا كان وضعنا صعب كنا نعتمد على المواد الغذائية وعلى الجمعيات الخيرية ما عاد نستفيد منهم هلا زيادة يعني كثرنا نعتمد على حالنا نشتغل بالأرض شوي وبالخضرة وهي ما عاد نستفيد من الأول الدولة سكرت الطرقات وما عاد يوصلوا لنا شيء، المواد الغذائية، التوظيفات وهيك شيء ما عاد يعطونا شيء. طيب أنا استلمت هاي الحصة من من تنظيفات، يعني أنا رتحت عليهم وبلادي كلهم الحمد لله بناتي استعملون هاي الحصة عرفتي؟ وكله لف منيح الحمد لله وانبسطت كثير إنه رتحت كثير يعني وفرت علي خير الله يعني. بطلت انه اشتري مثلا في الشارع يعني بدل ما اشتري مثل هدول يعني بروح اشتري حي الله شغل لاولاد يعني غير عرفت كيف؟ Thank you so much, Kyrie and Anne, for collecting those videos. I feel like they both really bring to life a lot of the issues that that you both talked about. And um, yeah, just taking the time to help us put a face to, to um, the narrative and everything you've shared today. Um, and to uh, reinforce that, um, there was a comment in the chat box from Trudy Pool, uh, who doesn't have a question, but she wanted to thank all of the panelists for the incredible work that they're doing. Um, she's really in awe. So with that, um, I want to um, put out there a few questions that have come through the chat box. And um, the first one is for Anne. Um, what do you see as the main motivation behind the participatory and innovative approach to MH and SRH programs at UNHCR Rwanda? Have you seen these participatory or community-based approaches happening in other locations as well? Uh, when it comes to what we call participatory approach or community-based protection, uh, it's a cross-cutting approach uh, by UNHCR right now that we're trying to promote uh, as much as possible uh, in all um, 
location. It's an ongoing uh, process. Uh, of course, sometimes due to emergency, uh, etc., you feel that it's easier to just take the decision, but you realize that uh, consulting people, uh, identifying some skills, uh, etc., um, gives a broader uh, perspective and opportunities to all actions that can be uh, developed at a field level in a refugee camp, uh, for example, that it increases um, the involvement and commitment of people as well to be interested in the programs uh, that you are developing. And I would say that this is one of the main uh, lessons learned uh, from COVID, because as mentioned by some people, uh, by colleagues in other locations. Unfortunately, with COVID, uh, not all partners uh, have been able to maintain like a daily presence in the camp. In Kiziba, we've done uh, as much as we could, uh, but obviously not with the same uh, capacity. And so we have realized that refugees developed some uh, very stunning uh, activities to provide protection to other groups. Uh, etc. So I think it really helped us to like strengthen and further this uh, approach. But yeah, this is aimed to be implemented uh, in all locations. And I would say not even by just UNHCR. I think it's one of the lessons learned from this uh, protracted uh, situation all around the world where you should really start from the beginning uh, involving the community with, uh, within any action or programs uh, that you are developing. Mm -hmm. um, thank you so much. Um, I wanted to, uh, I don't know who would be best to answer around this. Julia, did you want to answer that question or say something about that? Yeah, I just wanted to um, underscore Anne's point on the motivation for participatory approaches. We find that uh, through the participatory approach, there is ownership by the local communities, but there is also an element of sustainability that cannot otherwise be reached without, you know, the hands-on and them feeling like it's ours, it's locally led, um, and we own this. So I just wanted to um, underscore Anne's point there. Mm -hmm. Really important. Um, that ownership is super critical to keep things moving and sustained. Um, I wanted to ask a question around uh, kind of coordination in, in these refugee settlement areas. Um, there has to be kind of coordination between multiple different agencies. And as Anne was speaking a bit about, um, you know, the reduction in assistance from the World Food Program um, kind of uh, enabled or uh, maybe it was happening at the same time, the, the distributions to go from Kotex pads uh, to cash. Um, can, can you speak a little bit, and this comes from a, a comment from the panelist, Leila, um, can you speak a little bit about examples um, of coordination across programs and agencies and when that's actually worked well with regards to menstrual health? It could be pre-pandemic, during the pandemic, um, you know, help us get an idea and understanding how all these different agencies are coordinated to meet the various menstrual health needs of women and girls. Over. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Danielle. That's a very um, good question, actually. Um, there is a tendency to move from um, individual implementation to more of a collaborative, a collaborative implementation as well as interventions. We find that now there is a shift to more of implementing within consortiums. I'll give an example. We have uh, a partnership that's coming up with Care International, and um, we are implementing under a consortium called Appeal. And with our hands um, together, with our efforts together, that way we are able to streamline the interventions. But it also gives us an opportunity to kind of learn from uh, each development partner's perspective and also benefit from the synergies and the unique skills that they bring on board. So for me, it's come from more individual to, um, you know, implementing collaboratively and more of a synergy. I don't know if that um, answers your question. Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, uh, maybe, maybe to just add on that, um, speaking of the appeal consortium specifically, we find out um, we have different partners. We have Womena, and Womena is coming with, you know, the aspect of menstrual cups. 
whereas Days for Girls um, comes with the aspect of menstrual health education and we come with as well as washable pads. So that way uh, for the women and girls, we are giving them one, a range of options to choose from in terms of menstrual care products, but also we help complement what other partners do not have. And at the end of the day, it's all success from our synergies and collaborative action. Absolutely. And having that ability to um, enable girls and women to make their own choice about what they're using for their bodies, I think also echoes this participatory approach, right? It's like, this is what I want today. Um, this is what's available and uh, enables them to feel good and, and carry on with their days. Um, anyone else want to uh, contribute to that question or answer? Yeah, Danielle, I'd like to speak to that question. Um, so in the um, Caucasus Bazaar response, the Rohingya response, there's a very strong and robust kind of um, intersector coordination group um, that really fosters good collaboration and coordination amongst different actors on a wide array of different kind of interventions and programs. Um, I mean, I'm specifically looking at menstrual health, you know, there's a variety of different sub subsectors working to, to deal with these issues. This is like the GBV subsector, the uh, menstrual, menstrual health and hygiene, menstrual health management and hygiene promotion working group, amongst others. Um, I think I can give a very tangible example. So a couple of months ago in Bangu, in Cox's Bazaar in the camps, there was a fire, um, a very large fire that affected three camps, three very large camps. And with um, within the span of you know days after that fire, you know through this intersector coordination group, you know a variety of different actors, whether it be UN, INGO, national NGOs, um, mobilized and worked together to distribute kits to um, menstruating kits to menstruating women and girls, whether it be pregnancy kits, hygiene kits, menstrual health kits, whatever it may be, um, and I think. That was quite remarkable given the given the emergency, but I think also there was this added layer of really good collaboration in that because in certain fire effects, in depending on the camp, certain organizations have stronger kind of connections because they're they they um, they occupy a leadership position in that camp with the camp authorities. Um, so if there was a specific camp, for example, where like UNFPA had a stronger relationship, we were able to leverage that relationship on behalf of another organization or sister UN agency to ensure that menstrual health, whether it be items, kits, whether it be radios with menstrual health um, pre-recorded programming on menstrual health, whether it be flashcards or IEC materials, different organizations and agencies were leveraging, you know, their unique comparative advantages to ensure that the full, a full suite and the full array of MHM programming was able to reach fire affected, um, fire affected populations. And I think that's a great example in which, you know, coordination across programs and agencies work really well to in regards to mental, menstrual health. Thank you. Wow, incredible. Thank you for giving us such a tangible example of that working on the ground and the coordination. That's what we need more of. And we'd love to see uh, and read case studies of that so we could um, implement that in other places. Um, the last question I wanna address, and this is for all of our panelists, is really around this um, idea of men and boys engagement. This is a constant theme within the menstrual health and hygiene world and wanted to ask, what are some best practices you've seen or um, implemented yourself where men and boys were involved um, in the conversations and interventions around menstrual health, menstrual health and hygiene? Over. Or maybe there is none. <laughs> okay. Maybe uh, I can start uh, on hmm. this. Uh, I think you have to take into account the, the cultural uh, background uh, first. Of course, this is a final goal to have an involvement of uh, men and boys, but it's true that uh, in Kiziba camp on um, issues related to sexual and reproductive health, early pregnancies that unfortunately have like boomed uh, during the, the COVID, uh, girls asked for more like targeted programs for themselves to have the power to be informed uh, and take decision on sexual and reproductive health with like possibly programs dedicated to them um, within the girls room for example because they were saying that uh, going to the health uh, center might expose them to like stigma and rumors because people would see that they're trying to access 
uh, some services on uh, sexual and reproductive health. They are not saying that boys should not uh, formed or involved, but they would say that first they want to be uh, the target and beneficiary of this program, and then they can extend it uh, to boys. But as I mentioned, we have peer-to-peer -peer, uh, students groups where it's equal between like 20 girls and 20 boys. Uh, being trained on sexual and reproductive health. In terms of coordination, as we mentioned, we try to involve like all partners from child protection, SGB, uh, the medical partner to train them. So they wouldn't only focus on the medical aspect, but have like a bigger picture of uh, all the risk. And they are in charge uh, by peers. So one boy, one girl to go together in each uh, village of the camp. Uh, to spread uh, sensitization message about it. Uh, another very good example, but this is more based on like an individual uh, basis involvement is a secondary school headmaster who is a refugee, uh, a man, and who has been like doing an amazing job in approaching uh, families to avoid uh, school dropout, uh, school dropout resulting from uh, early pregnancies where he tried to organize counseling session uh, between the parents and the children to explain the risk of dropping out of school to uh, promote like reconciliation within the family. Uh, etc. And uh, he's himself like really involved in a gender equality. He supports his wife who has a child to uh, continue her studies. He go kicks the baby at school, etc. So that's the kind of profile we've been trying to uh, to promote through some events uh, to the community. But uh, of course, it's like individual cases and it's step by step process to uh, raise awareness and change a bit the mindset uh, because otherwise yeah the mentality is sometimes a bit uh, tough uh, to approach when it comes to gender equality but it's baby steps and we have more partners on SGBV trying to promote like a men engagement uh, and men equality so it's um, yeah day-to-day -day efforts thank you baby steps. Um, well, I wanted to thank everyone so much. We're just coming up on time here. Um, today's session has been really informative um, for, for me and hopefully for the panelists and for all of you out there who joined us. Thank you for taking this hour out of your day. Um, I think um, I uh, speak for everyone when I say that uh, menstruation matters, but menstruation at the margins especially matters. And we need to keep advocating and fighting for um, the rights of everyone everywhere to make sure that no one is left behind. Um, I want to wish you all a very happy MH day on the 28th of May, bang your drums, get online, um, use the hashtag, it's time for action and MHD 2021. Um, this webinar will be um, distributed via I'm Her after the session. Um, and um, more information can come from Days for Girls for any additional questions or comments. Thank you all so, so much. It's been a delight. And I wish you nothing but the best MH day in 2021 and beyond.